the book of 1 Timothy, again, we've been walking through this book because it is Paul writing to a young pastor named Timothy, probably in the city of Ephesus. There is a, a great deal in these letters about the church. Uh, and you understand there are a lot of different ways that churches organize, a lot of different ways that churches conduct business. I'm not sure there's a perfect or a right way. Uh, our church has chosen to do certain things, and we try to do it based on the way we think maybe the, the New Testament did things and certainly some things here. When you get to the third chapter of 1 Timothy, it is a great deal about leaders. And a couple of weeks ago, we just talked about the fact that churches desperately need leaders. Uh, churches are made up of people, and people need leadership. Uh, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the idea of a leadership pipeline, that you need some older leaders, but you need some leaders following behind them. In fact, you need generations of leaders so that the body of Christ can continue on. In fact, Timothy is a young guy and Paul is an old guy. And there always must be this process. And in a church, we have teachers. We have uh, this last week, lots of different folks provided leadership for what our church was doing. But there are two in our church formal positions of leadership that we recognize. And, but we do that because they're basically what we think are biblical. One of them is the role of pastor, overseer. And we talked about that quite a bit last week. Uh, the first part of this third chapter talks about the expectations, the, the moral, the character requirements for somebody who is a pastor. And the bottom line is, no pastors can live up to that list. It is a list of high expectations, which basically says pastors are continually needing to be working up. Um, we also discussed the fact that biblically it does say that pastors are a gift to their congregation. Not sure you're all excited about that. I did have somebody who was visiting last Sunday who sent me an email, said they were going to go home and tell their pastor this week that he was a gift. Uh, there's something to be said about that, but you understand that creates a tremendous pressure, a burden that pastors need to see themselves as somebody who is a source of God's blessing. And there's some pretty heavy expectations with that. Uh, the role of deacon is the other one. And it is mentioned here in chapter 3 beginning in verse 8. And would suggest to you, it does not say that deacons are gifts. But actually, it says very clearly that the church needs deacons. And truth is, the role of deacon occurs in the church before pastors ever even show up. Deacons show up in Acts chapter 6, and we'll talk about that. But the concept of a deacon is vitally important. And deacons in different churches do different things. Uh, it just sort of works out that when we're at this Sunday... During the month of July, every year, we go through this process of selecting new deacons. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about that later on. But let me just read this statement about deacons that's recurred in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Deacons likewise. Now he's just got through saying this is the kind of people pastors ought to be. Now this is the kind of people deacons ought to be. And the bottom line is they pretty much are the same that deacons probably ought to be the same kind of spiritual men that pastors ought to be, that leadership in the church has some very high expectations. So deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine. And by the way, in our church, uh, our deacons make a commitment to not drink alcohol at all because of the community we live in and the problems that it causes in our community. Not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. And that phrase, blameless, it shows up for pastors and for deacons. And the truth is none of us are blameless. None of us are perfect. But it's this idea that never be content if they're going to be a, a leader in the church there has to be this goal of trying to be all that God wants you to be. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and households well. I just want to get this out. Uh, 
There is also a statement about pastors need to manage their children well. Uh, I have seen deacons' kids and pastors' kids running down the halls of church. And I just want to tell you, having a father who's a pastor and being a pastor's kid, any of my faults were because of the corruption that I got from deacons' kids. I, I know that's the way it worked. I, I'm sure that's the way that played out. Uh, none of us have perfect kids, but at least we're going to correct them when they're wrong. It's part of that deal. Manage their own households well. Let those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I, I think we'll stop there today. The role of deacon. Um, there are a couple of different things that play out about it. It is a role that exists. And, and let me suggest to you that, that in my own understanding, this idea of the role of deacon really is the testimony to the fact that churches are not perfect. Because if you understand what the role of deacon is really about, it always exists because churches have problems. Churches are not perfect. In fact, every single church that we know of in the New Testament has a problem. When Paul writes to churches, as much as he says good things, in almost every one of them he addresses issues in every single church. There are doctrinal issues, there's moral issues, there are how they're doing things. I mean, there's all kinds of personal issues. Churches are not perfect mostly because they're made up of people. And by the way, I've heard if you ever find a perfect church, don't join it. In fact, don't even attend it very often because you'll probably mess it up. You'll be a bad influence. The reality is that churches are made up of sinners and consequently no churches are perfect. All churches have problems and for that reason the role of deacon came into existence to help churches deal with problems as they arise. In fact, I, I will just make this statement. I've made it lots of times and I am more and more convinced Good churches are not good churches because they never have problems. Good churches are good churches because when problems arise, they deal with them in godly and Christian way. And that's really the issue for deacons. In fact, it goes back to the book of Acts, the sixth chapter. And that's where the issue of deacons really starting comes from. It was an exciting time in the early church. I mean, the apostles are leading, they're preaching, people are being saved, people have everything one in accord, the, the fellowship, the koinonia is exciting, they're doing miraculous things, and then they, they begin some new ministries. And one of them, these are pre-food stamp days, there's no social security, and so there are widows that are coming to know Christ, they're into the church, and some of them are going hungry. So the early church starts ministering and providing food for widows and all of a sudden, in the middle of that exciting time, there are some Greek widows who feel like there's some Jewish widows who are getting special treatment. Somehow they're getting treated better and frankly, they don't think it's right and they're upset and suddenly in the midst of this exciting time in the church, there's this attitude of grumbling and unhappiness going on in the life of the church. And it's so serious that the apostles hear about it and they get the whole church together. And here's what the apostles say, and it's kind of important. They say, first of all, it's not right for us, the apostles, Peter, James, John, the rest of the apostles, it's not right for us to take time away from the ministry of the word, from preaching and sharing the gospel. It's not right for us to take time away from that and then they use the phrase, and this is in Acts chapter 6, to wait tables. Now, obviously, it's a food ministry, so it has to do with dealing with food. But they use a unique word, and the word for wait tables is a reference to a particular kind of slave that existed in those days called the diakonos. And the diakonos was a house slave. A slave in particular that was a table slave. You had slaves who worked in the fields. You had slaves who worked in the stables. There were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. But there was one particular kind of slave that worked in the dining rooms. And when the master and all of the household and all the guests were eating, the diakonos stood behind them and watched. Waited for somebody's glass to be empty and they'd fill it up. Kind of like a waiter or a waitress. But... 
didn't ran out of food. Well, we'll bring some more food. Um, somebody dry, I don't know if they used forks and knives. I think they ate with their fingers a lot. But, but uh, if you ran out with something and they, they were there and they were constantly watching. So they had this idea of watching for a need that needed to be taken care of. And they were men or women who stepped in and they were the diakonos. And that's the term the apostles used. And they said, it's not right for us to solve this problem with our time and our energy. You need to find somebody else to do it. And their answer, inspired by God, was, look among you and select seven men. And basically, those seven men are going to take care of this issue for the church. And they are going to become the diakonos, the deacons. And so there's some requirements. We already read some character things in 1 Timothy 3. But in that particular passage in Acts 6, it says, Look among you and pick out seven men. First of all, they need to be men of good reputation. Secondly, they need to be men full of the Holy Spirit. They need to be spiritual men. Thirdly, they need to be men full of wisdom. So that means they're men who make good choices and good decisions. They they know how to pray and ask from God who is the giver of all real wisdom. Then they need to be men who accept responsibility because the apostles say we're going to get these men and we're going to give them this responsibility. They're the kind of men who if they take a job, they do it. They don't do it halfway. They do it all the way. They accept responsibility. And they says, and we will give them this job. And the Bible says that this idea pleased the whole body of Christ. And so they looked among them and they chose seven men. And their names are lynched in Acts chapter 6. The two ones we know the most are Philip and Stephen. In fact, we know about Stephen a little bit later on is going to become really the first martyr for the Christian faith. But here's what I want to tell you. They had this idea that we need to find a group of men in our church who literally solve problems. That's what they do. They solve problems. Problems arise in every church. But this idea that that we need to solve them, and it says that because of them doing this, in Acts chapter 6, the result is the Word of God continued to increase. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of even the priests became obedient to the faith. In other words, because they began to solve problems well, the church continued to grow. Now, there are a couple things I just want to throw out here. One of them is this particular story and the issue, the reason that deacons occur, bring up this issue that problems happen in every church. They do. It's just natural. Every church is going to have problems. Some widows are going to think they get treated better than some other widows. Some Sunday school classes think they have not as nice carpet as somebody else has. Somebody didn't get to go first in the potluck dinner line. Somebody thinks the air conditioner is better on their side of the church than the other side. I mean, there's lots of silly things. Sometimes they're serious things. But it's just natural that it happens in the life of a church. And for a church to be able to be what it ought to be, there needs to be a process for solving those problems in a redemptive and a positive way. And the picture for this was the idea of deacon. But it also suggests that when these problems arise, they distract the church from doing what they ought to do. This thing about the apostles saying, Listen, we we can't stop sharing the gospel to spend our time and energy on this particular issue. We need to get somebody to resolve it so that we don't get distracted. Have you ever been in a church that got all of their energy and all of their time was suddenly on problems that had arisen? And that's always a danger in the church. And so in our church, we have chosen to select individuals, men to serve as deacons, and we give them responsibilities. The most important responsibility they have is to help us as a church to avoid problems and when they come up to solve them as quickly and as Christian and gracious a manner as we possibly can so that the body of Christ can go on. So let me just tell you how that happens in our church. In our church, uh, there are at any one time about 20 men who serve us in this spiritual role of deacon. They agree to four-year terms 
and after the fourth year they have to rotate off and they can't serve and so they're staggered and every year during July we do this ballot process and I want to tell you I, I know we do it every year so you, oh it's that time again I believe it is one of the most important things we do in the life of our church next Sunday you'll have a ballot. It will be a different color. We're far from Chicago. It's not vote early and often. Uh, But the names of the men who are above age 21 and who are members of our church and live in the area or resident members are on the back. And by the way, we always put out this sample ballot because we do it by computer and sometimes there's a name that gets left off. We try never to do that. So if you read it and there's a name that's not there that should be, let us know and it'll be there next week. On the front, there's uh, men who are currently serving, and there's a list, and and just to sort of paint the picture, these are the men who are rotating off, and this kind of tells you the kind of men that they are. Dan Bledsoe, Kevin Gurley, Howard Levine, Wayne Lovell, Dave Ring, and Kurt Roberts. Now, this year, there's six rotating off because of a, uh, we had a vacancy that we filled, so we did six in one year. So there's six names, and I will tell you, those are pretty good names. Um, I was concerned about a couple of them being uh, dignified. I don't, Dan Bledsoe and, and Dave Ring and, I, you know, Howard, I, I'm not sure about dignified. I guess having a bad sense of humor doesn't mean you're not dignified. Uh, but these are good, godly men. And I will just tell you, my experience over the years is that anytime there was something I thought we needed to be doing as a church or, or there was something really important, a decision we needed to make, The deacons are the men that I go to. Or when I'm concerned about a problem that may be coming in our church, the deacons are the men that I go to. And I trust their judgment and I trust their wisdom. And I'm convinced that they provide for us leadership. Now, they have some formal things. We, because of the the widow business, we assign widows. All of our deacons watch over the widows in our church and they connect with them. That's one of their responsibilities. They also, by the way, greet for us. They are kind of the heart of our greeting ministry so that we greet people as they come in. But that's also a way for them to sort of judge and gauge the spirit of our church. Because I tell you, when you watch people come into church, you kind of get a sense for what's going on spiritually in the church. But what they really do is they watch. And they watch what's going on and they're judging our church and watching to make sure that things are going as they ought to, that we have the right spirit, the right attitude. And and they provide a tremendous benefit. And frankly, one of the reasons, and I think we are a good church, but I can tell you countless times when it was deacons who helped us to avoid issues and to resolve issues and have created that spiritual sense in the body of Christ. And before there were ever pastors, there were deacons. And so next Sunday, you'll come in and you'll hopefully with a prayerful mind select five names. Now, I looked at the ballots from last year. I think there were about 13, 12 or 13 different men who got lots of votes. The way it turned out, there were five men who were kind of way at the top. And those five men began to be the servants. And next year, we'll make that decision next week. But I will tell you that It is critically important. The church needs leadership, but the kind of leadership they need is redemptive leadership. It is really about solving problems. And I will tell you that the greatest problem solver in the world was Jesus Christ. The greatest problem in the world was sin. And Jesus came and he resolved the problem, and that's where we get the word redemption. And the body of Christ is all about solving problems. And there ought to be this spirit in our church that says, okay, stuff hums up. I get upset. There's a problem here. Somebody disagrees about this. It may be a lot of different kinds of things. But rather than being just destroyed, it becomes the opportunity for figuring things out. There's an attitude of redemption, of positiveness, of, of taking whatever it may be. And let me just tell you, life is filled with problems. In your personal life, life is filled with problems. In the body of Christ, life is filled with problems. And there becomes a Christian virtue of how do you face problems. And if you face them with grace and wisdom and finding of answers, that's a good deal. I I shared with them in the first service, and I don't know why I was thinking about it, but it was a business meeting 20 plus years ago when uh, we learned that the electrical service to our building was not very safe. 
we had little screw-in fuses, and there's a, 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 a breaker box right back here with those little screw-in fuses. After Sunday morning, if you put your hand on it, it would almost burn you. It was that hot. It was overheating the wire. I mean, and it was going to be like a $50,000 fix, and we didn't have $50,000. And in the business meeting, people were kind of upset. I mean, they were, what are we going to do? And they kind of, you know, well, why didn't we figure this out before? And by the way, when it comes to problems, sometimes there's denial. You know, we pretend like we don't have a problem, or sometimes we blame somebody else. That's kind of a, well, it's your fault if you hadn't done this. And, and that was starting to go on. And one of our older men, who was a deacon, who's gone to be with the Lord now, stood up and he said, basically, you know, you and I are evidently all surprised about this, but I don't think God was surprised. God knew what our wiring was like, and he knew we were going to have to fix it. I think God probably has an answer for us. And I believe we came up with the money to fix the wiring within just about a month or two. And we were able to go on, and there's this attitude that says, we're going to solve whatever the problem is. And I would suggest to you that that's good for the church, but it's also good for individuals. And I would encourage you today to think, are you a problem-solving person or are you a problem-creating person? Do you sort of dwell in drama? Do you love to, to just be, do you find yourself getting upset about everything all of the time? Are you a person who, by the grace of God, with His love and His wisdom, is about finding solutions? Because that's this, this picture of how the church ought to work is a picture of how your family ought to work. And there's something good about saying, okay, Christ, I, I want to be, whether you are ever elected to be a deacon in a church or not, I want to be that kind of person. I want to be the kind of person that sees problems and fixes them. I want to be the kind of person who is redemptive. I want to be a person of wisdom. I want to be a person filled with the Spirit. I want my reputation to be right. I want people to trust me and know that if they give me a job, I can finish it because I'm a responsible person. I want to be a person who manages my kids well, if I can just keep them away from those deacons' kids. I, I want my family to run well. I want my life. This is the kind of person I want to be. And let me tell you, God blesses that. And when deacons were selected, when the church looked and said, okay, here's the men, the kingdom of God grew. And God blessed that church. And God has blessed our church because of those choices in the past. And I'm pretty confident that whatever the names end up being next week, God is going to keep blessing us. But I would hope every single one of us would say, if that's good for the church, that's good for my family. That's good for my home. That's good for my business. That's good for my job. That's the kind of person I want to be. Well, today we're going to sing, Serve the Lord with Gladness. Deacons are about servanthood. In fact, diakonos literally means table servant. I hope that all of us have that same mindset of seeing problems and solving problems with the grace of Jesus Christ and His wisdom. We're going to stand. There's some reason you need to come forward today. We invite you to do that. It might be about membership in the body of Christ. It might be about service. It might be about Jesus Christ Himself. Let's sing.